Hello, Alex here, and in this video I want to ask and answer the question. Is the Kodak Rito Ektar H35 a point and shoot or a piece of sh**? I've had this camera for a few months now and just to put it out there, no one sent this to me to review, not that I would expect them to. I bought it myself with my own money for about 50 euros. I've had it for a few months now and I've shot three and a half rolls of film. So I've got pictures from three rolls to show you in this video. Those being a roll of Shaka Color C200 and a roll of Lomography Lomochrome Purple, just because funsies. And then a roll of T-Max 100, which I developed in Xtal, just to really give the lens the best possible chance to show off what it can do. The Ektar H35 is manufactured and sold by Rito under the Kodak branding. And like the Olympus Pen FT that I spoke about recently, it is a half frame 35mm camera, taking pictures that are half as wide as a normal 35mm frame, so 18 by 24 millimeters instead of 36 by 24 millimeters, netting you twice as many photos per roll, but with them being half the size. However, for a camera like this, like a point and shoot, you don't have a lot of quality to begin with if you're shooting full frame. So there theoretically isn't that much degradation of image quality. You're not losing a lot compared to say a half frame 35 mil camera like the Pen FT versus a regular 35 millimeter SLR where sharp glass, you're kind of dealing with a more noticeable drop in image quality, at least to the average person. One thing to note is that the 18 by 24 millimeter picture size means that your pictures are in vertical portrait orientation by default. The lens is not interchangeable, which is perfectly fine and normal for a camera in this class. It is a fixed aperture, fixed focal length prime lens with a 22 millimeter focal length. In terms of 35 millimeter field of view, accounting for the error in the differing aspect ratios, the approximate crop factor of about 1.4 X gives you a field of view equivalent of about a 31 millimeter lens in 35 millimeter terms. The lens is a not a doublet, but a two element acrylic optical construction, which promises superior image quality compared to the singlet lens elements that you see in a lot of these kind of cheapo plastic fantastic point and shoot cameras. The aperture is fixed at f9.5 and focusing is fixed at about 1.5 meters or five feet. So you're really just relying on that depth of field to hopefully get your subject in focus within your actual frame. In terms of the shutter, there is only a single shutter speed, 1 100th ish of a second, and it's triggered just with the single shutter release button on the top of the camera. There are no options for a threaded cable release and the camera does not have a self timer. Realistically, that's fine, but I'm just putting that out there. The shutter is cocked when you rotate the gear on the lower back of the camera to advance the film, and there's no way to do these two things separately. The camera itself is constructed primarily from ABS and is extremely lightweight at just 100 grams plus the weight of the film and AAA battery. You don't need the battery to use the camera per se, it's just to power the flash. The camera is available in four colors, those being black, brown, sand and sage, and I bought mine in sage because Kai picked it for me. Not Kai Wong, different Kai. Speaking of the flash, with a fixed shutter speed, fixed aperture, and no way to push or pull individual shots on a roll of 35 millimeter film, you're gonna be using the flash to control your exposure, either directly when indoors or maybe as a fill light when shooting outdoors. It's not the most powerful, but it gets the job done, to be perfectly honest. To power on the flash, just rotate the ring around the lens. This is not threaded, so you cannot natively attach filters, but I'm sure the plastic is soft enough that you could tap a step up ring onto it if you really wanted to. When you turn on the flash, you do hear the capacitors whine a little bit, and it's worth noting that this ring dial switch is just to charge the flash, not whether or not it's actually involved in the process of taking the picture, so to speak. What I mean is if you charge up the flash, then turn it off and then take a picture, the flash will still go off because it's fully charged. There's no disconnect within the camera to actually prevent the flash going off. So if you aren't definitely going to be taking your next photo with flash, it might be worth turning the flash off immediately after using it to take a picture, if that makes sense. Film is loaded into the camera with a sort of pseudo quick load system. Just insert the leader into the slot, close the door, Bob's your uncle, just start advancing and you're good to go. The film gate itself is curved, which is pretty typical for these acrylic lens cameras. 
because it helps improve uh, field curvature or deal with the field curvature, I suppose, improving overall image sharpness and controlling distortion. One amusing thing to note is that the viewfinder and the film gate are both blatantly just infilled with extra plastic from a generic OEM 35 millimeter camera. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but it just stands out as really obvious and I find it kind of funny. Believe it or not, I do have good things to say about this camera. It's extremely lightweight and the boxy shape means it's pretty easy to transport just about anywhere. I carry it with me pretty much all the time and there's really no reason not to. The two element design does mean that the lens is surprisingly sharp, albeit mostly in the center, especially compared to its peers. Obviously, being a half frame camera, you get twice as many photos per roll. And with a camera like this, as I mentioned earlier, you're not getting that kind of super high image quality to begin with anyway. So you're not losing a lot by having pictures that are half the size. I'm running out of things to say. It comes in nice colors. I probably wouldn't have gone for the sage green color myself, but you know, that's what Kai picked. This thing feels like it's gonna break pretty much every time you touch it. The shutter release feels awful. The rear film door feels awful. Dan nearly had a stroke when I gave him the rewind lever to feel how nasty that feels. It feels like you're breaking it, especially when you actually pull out the spindle to either put in or take out your cartridge. It just feels horrible. QC isn't great as well. There's some bit of a flash or a, a burr somewhere in mine that is scratching every negative that I put through it, which I really don't like. As well, I have very inconsistent frame spacing, which has only got me about 69 photos per roll. It's actually caused a couple of pictures to overlap, which is really not a good thing. You know, you don't have a lot of resolution to begin with here. You don't want to lose that. Additionally, my copy of the lens is heavily decentered with the top half of the frame being much sharper softer, softer than the bottom half of the frame, which is, you know, not really acceptable on something that's already such mediocre quality. There's really no possibility to do realistic double exposures with this camera. Because the advance of the film and the sprockets dragging a gear is what actually cocks the shutter, the only way you could realistically do a multiple exposure is to open the camera in the dark, pull out the spindle, lift out the canister while not losing the take-up spools position, cock that gear by hand, put the canister back in, put the spindle back in, close the back and take it out and shoot again. It's really not worth doing that. And for a camera like this, you really do almost expect the ability to do multiple exposures in my opinion. Speaking of plastic fantastic cameras that can do multiple exposures quite famously, there's no bulb mode. Even a Holga has a bulb mode and Holgas have two aperture settings for the most part. So that gives you an idea of how feature lacking this thing really is. The price at about 50 euros compared to most of these other cameras, which are usually in the 30 to 40 euros region, most of which will come with one or even two rolls of film in the box. It's a bit of a hard sell but it depends how much you're gonna be shooting with it, I suppose. For me, I plan to use this, you know, relatively frequently-ish for a decent amount of time. And I expect that after six or seven rolls of film, it will have paid for itself versus one of those other competing cameras. So at every technical level, this camera is pretty poor. It has fewer features than a Holga, it's built worse than its competitors, and it costs more. And at least in my case, image quality and quality control are both pretty bad. And for the purposes I wanted to use it for, that doesn't matter. If you're in the market for a camera like this, I would strongly consider weighing up the film economy, given the overall image quality of this class of camera versus the build quality and lower price of its competitors. But that's if you even want a camera like this, which a lot of people won't, and that's totally okay. I bought it because I wanted it and I'm having a great time with it but I'm under no illusion that it's a good camera. So, is the Kodak Rito Ektar H35 a PNS or a POS? It's both, mostly the latter, and that's okay. That's it for this video. Stay safe and bye-bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Shaka1277 for new pictures every day. 
If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.